Hello, it's a great privilege to speak to you today on a very important topic, cervical cancer prevention. I have nothing to disclose. Cervical cancer affects more than half of a million women around the world every year. In year 2018, 311,000 women died of cervical cancer. The majority of cervical cancer new cases and death occur in low and middle income country. Cervical cancer is the most common women cancer in 23 out of 46 or half of the Sub-Saharan African countries. The highest incidence of cervical cancer is in East Africa, with Eswatini having the highest incidence at 43.1 per 100,000 women, followed by Malawi. The survival of cervical cancer in sub-Saharan Africa is poor. The five-year survival is at 33%. Therefore, the most common cause of cancer-related death in sub-Sahara Africa is cervical cancer. It approximates one in five women die from cancer were the death coming from cervical cancer. This is a world's map showing the incidence of cervical cancer with a darker blue indicating a high incidence of cervical cancer. As you can see, the highest cervical cancer incident is crowded in the sub-Saharan African countries. Likewise, this map depicts the cancer death from cervical cancer with the darker red indicating the higher death. Again, the highest mortality is also concentrated in sub-Saharan African countries. Breaking down the sub-Saharan African countries in regions, Eastern Africa has the highest number of new cases, an approximate of half of our new cases in sub-Saharan African countries. The incidence rate is at 42.7 per 100,000 women. The cancer death also is highest in Eastern Africa. As we all know, cervical cancer is caused primarily by HPV or the human papilloma virus infection. The prevalence of the HPV infection, again, is highest in Eastern Africa, with 20% of the general population infected with the human papilloma virus. It is lower in Central, Western, and Southern Africa, but not by much. This is a projection of the new cases in Middle, Eastern, Western, and Southern Africa. As you can see, in almost 20 years' time, there is a doubling of the new cases. For example, in Eastern Africa, in 2012, the incidence is the highest with 45,000 new cases. And by 2030, which is 10 years from now, 
number almost nearly doubled to 83,000 cases. As a whole, Sub-Saharan Africa, comparing to 2012, by year 2030, the number of new cases also nearly doubled from 90,000 to 160,000 new cases of cervical cancer. So some things got to be done, and I quoted here some strategies reported by Jedi Akbar. Proposal is to look at vaccination against human papillomavirus and do population-wide screening. And we do need a good population-based registry to carefully monitoring these successes. HPV infection from the initial infection to cancer. It takes really quite a long time. It can be really up to 15 years. You look at the initial HPV infection onto the normal epithelium to result in a persistent infection takes about seven months to a year. And then over the next five years, the progression with some cofactors contributing to it, it takes five years to become a high grade or CIN3 lesions. And from CIN3 to cervical cancer would take another 10 years. And what are these cofactors? Smoking as one, nutrition, age of first sexual intercourse, number of partners, and oral contraceptives. The host factors, the lower immune system, and the specific genetic HRA system, pregnancy, the virus factors, the specific genotypes of HPV, the viral persistence, integration of the HPV genome in host DNA and cause infections with herpes virus or bacteria may all play as important cofactors contributing to the progression of CIN to high-grade CIN to cervical cancer. But we really have ample opportunities throughout this time period to prevent a woman from developing cervical cancer. Of course, vaccination can prevent the infection. And later on with secondary prevention with screening and treatment of precancerous lesion can prevent a woman from developing cervical cancer. So we do have a lot of opportunities throughout this 10, 15 years time. HPV vaccines have been available since 2006. We have the bivalent and quadrivalent, more recently the nivalent HPV vaccines available. These vaccines, the bivalent cover the two high risk HPV types, type 16 and 18. The quadrivalent covers the benign causing HPV and the high risk HPV types, the cervical cancer causing types 16 and 18. Since four years ago, we have the nivalent and the nivalence in addition to 6, 11, 16, and 18 covers the other five HPV types of infections. So with the bivalent and quadrivalent, we can prevent 70% of the cervical cancer. And with nivalent, we can prevent 90% of cervical cancer. The dosings were recommended as a three dose regimen and be given between nine and 26 year old women and girls. Of course, ideally you should really give the vaccine the earlier the better between nine and 11 years. So over 71 countries 
have a national vaccination program. However, only 4% of the eligible girls and women have been vaccinated and mostly these girls and women reside in high income countries. So what are the barriers for HPV vaccination? The cost is one and the logistics of delivering the three dose regimens is another barrier. World Health Organization recommends a target coverage of greater than 80% of the women population. In 2014, because of the challenges of three dose regimens, research had been done on two dose schedule and felt that it is not inferior the strategic advisory group of experts recommended a two dose schedule at zero and six months can be given to girls prior to 15 years of age. There are a lot of successes in African countries. The first being in Rwanda in 2011 are uh, the HPV vaccine was introduced and was given to the school-based grade six and out of school girls with a three dose regimen. And they were able to cover 98.7% of the target populations. And many other countries had also adopted the school-based and out of school girls vaccination programs, either with one or two dose regimens and have been quite successful from any, anywhere to be given to 70% to 90% coverage. So we have a lot of good successes in several African countries, which we can learn from. What about one dose HPV vaccinations? It's been shown that a single dose can elicit high titers of antibodies and potent B memory cells. There were two ongoing studies, one in Costa Rica showed that a one dose HPV vaccination is not inferior to two or three dose regimens. In India, the study showed that a one dose regimen is equally protective as two or three doses against HPV 16 and 18 infections up to seven years. The principal question remains is, can this one dose be long enough to cover the next four to five decades? And do we need a second booster dose to assure the protection against this infections. Cervical cancer screening is another opportunity to prevent a woman from developing cervical cancer. In 2016, ASCO published a resource certified clinical practice guideline on secondary prevention of cervical cancer. The recommendation is that if we could if resources allow is to conduct HPV DNA testing, visual inspection with acidic acid or VIA may be used in lower resource settings such as basic setting. How often should we do the cervical cancer screening? In the limited setting is to do genotyping and or cytology between the age group of 30 and 49 years so, and to do it every 10 years. For the basic setting where BIA is offered, it's recommended between the age group of 30 and 49 years so, with the target of doing one to three times per lifetime. In terms of treatment, 
in the limited setting, the loop electrosurgical excision procedure or ablation is recommended. In the basic setting, cryotherapy or loop electrosurgical excision procedure ablation is recommended. VIA offers a great opportunity as a single visit approach. It combines screening and treated at the right, right indication in the same setting and maximizes compliance to the treatment. A major challenge with VIA is the difficulty in the quality assurance not to have too many false positive results and also the to have a consistent screening performance. HPV testing is more sensitive, is accurate, and it's reproducible. It has a high negative predictive value. When the test is negative, it offers a long protection so we can have longer screening intervals for HPV negative women. It's been shown in India a single round of HPV screening has been followed by a significant reduction of cervical cancer mortality. And HPV testing also offers the opportunity for self-collection and it would allow screening for women reside in remote areas. At this year's ASCO meeting 2020, there were abstracts demonstrating the innovative ideas of cervical cancer screening. This abstract presented as a poster came from Brazil. What they look at is the evaluation of a mobile unit to screen for cervical cancer. And what they found that was the mobile screening unit helps uh, the access to pap tests in communities where they are remote and it was difficult and have fewer healthcare providers. And this mobile unit will uh, go back and treat these women upon uh, having the pap test results come back. Another abstract was um, reported by the Colombians. They develop a accessible mobile app that identifies women at risk for breast and cervical cancer. And the goal of the study was to detect barriers to early cancer detection. So I think what it's interesting for, for you all to know is ASCO is not just about therapy. It is also about prevention and screening. And any of your research are welcome to be submitted to ASCO at, and presented at the annual meeting. Now WHO set a, a goal the goal is to reduce the cervical cancer incidence to four per 100,000 women. So remember, we were talking about this high incidence in Eastern Africa of greater than 40 per 100,000 and really want to cut down to 10% of what it was. And how can we achieve that? Is to vaccinate 90% of all the girls by age 15, screen 70% of women between the age group of 35 and 45 years old, and treat more than 90% of precancerous lesions through screening. I know these are very ambitious, but if we could achieve the 90, 70, and 90, and we will be able to almost put cervical cancer away um, and to achieve a less than four per 100,000 
it is really a wonderful um, target to set it. Now, we have a lot of research, a lot of studies show that the HPV vaccination can prevent the HPV infection, it can prevent the precancerous lesion. But this year, in October, which was two months ago, we have the first research published in New England Journal of Medicine looking at the vaccination and the risk of invasive cervical cancer. Lee et al., they look at the Swedish cancer registry, looking at more than 1.6 million Swedish girls and women who were between the age group of 10 and 30 years old. And they look at the women who received the quadrivalent HPV vaccines versus the other group did not. And among the group that received the vaccination, they also broke it down. Did they get it earlier in life or later in life? How would that impact on the cervical cancer incidence? The authors found that the vaccination was associated with a substantial reduced risk of invasive cervical cancer at the population level. So here is the finding. What you see here is the cumulative incidence of cervical cancer per 100,000 persons. And here is age at follow-up. Now, this red line is the unvaccinated women. And you see that as years go by, there's increasing number of new cervical cancer cases. And this blue dotted line is the vaccinated woman, but they got the vaccine a little bit later in life between this age of 17 and 30 years old. So, you know, this is really expected, right? When the HPV vaccine first came out, so a lot of women want to take it. So they look at this woman, they wanted to take it, but they take it later because there was a time when the vaccine was introduced. So what they found was, yes, there was a reduction of cervical cancers. And what about the group of women that received vaccination younger than the age of 17? And they found a very substantial reduction in cervical cancer incidence, not just to the unvaccinated group, but also to the vaccinated group but at the later years in their lives. So what it's saying is it's really important to give vaccination and to give it early. And this is really a very important study to show that, yes, cervical cancer vaccine, not just prevent infection, but it does decrease the cervical cancer incidence. Now, with the primary prevention, HPV vaccination, secondary prevention through screening and treatment, and the tertiary prevention, where you heard a lot today on the presentations from the posters and uh, oral presentations focus on surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. Now the success rate can be 70 to 90% with vaccination, just the shots. And screening and treatments, if you get the right patient, it's very effective, 80% effective. But it's a lot of work, right? You have to go and do VIA or you do do HPV testing or colposcopy biopsy. You have to do cryo or loop. So a lot of things you do, but a good outcome. When you come to surgery, especially those with locally advanced or metastatic, the survival will be poor. So our success is very high if we look at vaccination and then lower and lower with the secondary prevention and the lowest, you have to do a lot, spend a lot of money, and then you don't have great outcomes when you compare to just shots. So in conclusion, the burden of cervical cancer in sub-Saharan Africa is substantial. And there is a great need for improved prevention. Widespread implementation of cervical cancer screening is needed 
primary prevention through HPV vaccination is a cost-effective preventive measure. The high vaccine coverage and sustainable programs that you saw in Rwanda, Uganda, can be delivered with strong commitment from the government through comprehensive planning with Ministry of Health, as well as education and early community sensitization. My dream, so are your dream, is one day our daughter, our spouses, our mother will not be dying from cervical cancer. Thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate your time.